hear me. Excuse me, America. Чем сила? А вы что собираетесь на ней жениться? Да. Ух, красота ты какая, лепота. Таможня дает добро. Я вообще не называю меня пожалуйста Вера. Кто я? Вот кто я? Отныне русские земля единый быть. Hi, my name's Ali and this is the Rus Files Unite podcast where we watch Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I'm joined by a guest and today my guest is Sasha. Hi Sasha. Hi Alistair, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm very well too. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um thank you Sasha very much for for joining me. Now, before we talk about the film we're going to watch today, uh could you please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Um my, my name is Sasha Lyukovich. Uh, I'm from Belarus. I'm uh, 38 years old. I I live in London. I've been living in London since 2001 and uh, yes I I am musician. Uh, I've got a band in London uh, called the Highly Skilled Migrants so we call ourselves uh, Sasha Yukovich and the Highly Skilled Migrants and uh, yes I've been uh, playing uh, music in London mainly and uh, releasing new songs and uh, just a few months ago I released my uh, we released a new album called Minsk and uh, currently we're working on a new project and hopefully it's going to be another album and also I'm working on a new poetry performance project as well so we hopefully we'll have this performance uh, later this year awesome that sounds excellent so uh, as far as getting into into music so like growing up in Belarus in the well 80s and and 90s like what kind of music did you listen to and what kind of made you think you know I want to be a musician full time um i guess uh growing up in um, in USSR in the 80s especially uh, I, i you know i still was a child so my ears were open to all sorts of music but um i when i was uh, Uh, about nine years old, I wanted to learn uh, an instrument, how to play an instrument, and uh, there was an opportunity to learn how to play balalaika. So I joined uh, uh, in my village. I joined a local ensemble, and uh, yes, so I was uh, given a balalaika, and uh, we, mainly we played uh, traditional songs for. <laughs> For veterans of the Second World War, back then, including my grandfather, that I was very proud to perform for him and his uh, colleagues, and also for quite often for milkmaids <laughs> celebrating International Women's Day or all sort of uh, uh, events in uh, 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 organized for collective farm. Yeah, so that was my uh, my starting point, and uh, I also have an older brother. He's about seven years old. Yeah, he's seven years older than me. And the, you know, you always when you have a uh, older siblings, you always look up to your uh, older siblings. And uh, huh. well, to interrupt you, I'm the I'm the older sibling in in my family, and I never got that level of respect from my younger siblings. But then we oh. were a bit closer in age, so maybe that was what's going on there. <laughs> right? No, no, I did, I did, I did look up to my brother especially. And oh, um, well, I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, he, you know, sort of, I learned about all sort of music uh, from him, first of all, and I would listen to that music even if he, even if I didn't understand it or even if I didn't like it, you know, so <laughs> I just thought it's so cool to listen to that sort of music. For instance, I remember he 
he brought a um, cassette with Depeche Mode, for instance. He was a big fan of Depeche Mode, and I remember I was listening to Depeche Mode, and a lot of actually also... Um, I think Depeche Mode was probably the first British band I've heard ever. Mm. Not not like, you know, when you speak to a, a Russian uh, person, they will always glorify the Beatles, for instance, or, you know, Deep Purple or something. But actually... I, I didn't know those bands until later, <laughs> you know, and also being in the village, growing up in the village, you, you know, I was limited to access, especially back in the years of Saturdays, you know, to uh, sure. to some radio stations and, you know, it just, it was a proper Iron Curtain, living behind the Iron Curtain, but things did, uh, did reach even our countryside, you know, including Depeche Mode, and uh, also I remember later on my brother was still listening to, um, like, a lot of bands from um, uh, Russia, you know, um, Russian rock, as they call it now. Um, yeah, that was already 90s, especially for the most famous band back then was Nautilus Pampilios, you know, this is what I'm, I remember uh, listening a lot, and... Yeah, so, and then, only my my university days, in the uh, mid-90s, and the end of 90s, I started exploring more music, especially, you know, Britpop obviously was very popular, you know, bands like Radiohead, and uh, I remember Trip Hop Movement, Portishead, Machiba, you know, Tricky, all those people. So, I uh, sort of, gradually, I was building... Um, interest in uh, discovering all sort of music but uh, yes and i remember when i was 16 uh, i got um, a guitar on uh, you know the 23rd of february it's a uh, in russia some in russia they you know there's international women's day but also there is a defenders day you know national defenders day. defenders of the fatherland day yeah exactly and i i never liked that uh celebration because it kind of automatically made me you know to 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 join military service and mm. uh, i never wanted to do that so and I, I never did so anyway on that day i got a guitar as a present so oh, cool I, so i became a, a defender but you know i guess using different uh tool or weapon uh, guitar and <laughs> music uh, you know so to reach out and uh, i started learning guitar uh, from the age 16 and then kind of but you know, I never had the time and passion to learn to learn the guitar properly. So I would mm. just play. Uh, let's say I would learn a couple of chords, and then I would just think, oh, I would, you know, I thought, oh, maybe I can just write something with just knowing three chords. So I would always work with my limitations, and instead of perfecting my skills, like you know, playing guitar, you know, solo guitar, learning sort of different riffs, I, I was more like intrigued by writing rather than you know improving mm. my playing skills so and this is how it all started gradually uh you know I, I gained more and more confidence and uh, to learn uh, to write songs and then to perform them yes yeah when was the first time you ever played in front of people in terms of like a gig if you like my own stuff or um i mean either really well, yeah, I mean, when I was a boy, we I played balalaika in front of, of course, people, yeah. yes. Um, and then the university, you, do you know KVN? You know, that sort of comic, comedy show uh, in Russia, KVN? No, no. no? I, I mean, I've probably seen clips of it, but... Yeah, it's abbreviation, KVN. I don't know what it stands for, KVN. Anyway, uh, so KVN was quite popular on uh, as a tv show and i think it's still popular mm. <laughs> so at universities we had to do different shows as well when we when i was a student and kevin was sort of uh, as well a competition between uh, students so it was our group where um, we developed our own show and jokes and stuff so that i rem and i remember there was a, there is a famous song I will recognize my darling by the way he walks. Something like that. So in Russian, I am Milova Oznaya Papachotki. There is a famous Russian singer Sukachov, and he covers this song. It's an old mm. traditional song, but he covered that song, and it basically gave another birth to it and became quite famous. So 
So as a joke, I rewrote this song uh, referring to our teachers, uh, oh, nice. orators at the university. And you know, they kind of, some of them are a little bit overweight, a bit clumsy. So I wrote each, each verse just was dedicated to a particular famous uh, teacher at the university. And I remember whole hall was just laughing. So I sang that song playing <laughs> guitar and everybody was just, uh, yeah bursting in tears and uh, we won we won the main prize and uh, so that was sort of uh, joyful and I remember uh, a little bit tipsy walking back uh, to my student apartment and I had to I can't remember but anyway I was crossing uh, a subway it's either I was going to take a train uh, underground train or I was just crossing the subway to another side of the road I can't remember now and then I saw I saw the girls coming towards me from university. I knew them, and I was carrying my guitar. And they said, oh, we loved your performance. Can you play a song to us? And, you know, obviously I was overwhelmed by that attention. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I decided to play, uh, um, you know, uh, another song to those t- ten girls. And um, I remember I just sang for like 12 or 20 seconds, a very short performance. And then I was approached by the police, and oh, no. uh, and they just basically arrested me because it was uh, so it was illegal to uh, do un, you know unorganized performances. So Wait, it was sort of like a or... sign of protest or something. So they took me to the police station, but these girls followed me, and they just begged those guys to release me. So I was released, and and then that sort of that to me that was kind of a sign. Oh, maybe I should just be a performer. Or whatever it takes me, but that was kind of I thought that was fun. <laughs> so yeah, certainly not lacking in uh, in incident. No, no, yes. And then the year I came to the UK later. Well, a few years later, maybe two or three years later after that happened, and I was very fortunate to meet a lot of interesting people in London because I, mm. I got a job here in antiquarian bookshop on Charing Cross Road in London. And that place was a mecca for art students and uh, very interesting people. And I was just learning about British culture from them, about music, about arts. And I was just just like going to university for me, you know, because, you know, improving my language skills. And that was the best environment to learn about, you know, learn about culture and uh, anything really. And one of the guys who work there he he became my friend we became friends after that he he's also a musician yozushi um he's uh, originally from japan but um yes he was quite um quite influential in terms of um he's he he was used to play a lot of gigs in london and uh, at one of the parties i played a couple of songs to him and he really liked them and he offered me a an acoustic slot uh, at one of his shows, so he gave me a, a sort of confidence, I would say, in in my things. And after that, I just started performing regularly and got a band and started writing more songs, more and more. And uh, yeah, it's, this how it all started, basically. <laughs> cool. That's really interesting, and it's and it is always so important that early on when you're starting some kind of like artistic endeavor that you meet somebody who's like yeah you're actually good at this you should keep doing it that's that's always good yes definitely um so as far as first coming to the uk was anything surprising or yeah how did your experiences like match up with how you thought it might be um well well when i came to the uh, to the uk i didn't think about performing at all. Um, guess what happened? Um, growing up in Belarus back then, USSR, and then, you know, I had to live through the 90s. And the 90s was a very tough time, you know, post-USSR collapsed, and it was just, just, just a very difficult time, you know, My, with money, with... Uh, prospects you know especially for young uh, young people who just wanted more than just being stuck in uh, under the uh, regime of Lukashenko you know it's sort of and uh, being Belarusian it's always been a little bit problematic kind of to to sort of to understand your own kind of cultural heritage 
Because mm. it's all like muddled up, you know, through all the history with Russia, with the USSR. And, you know, so 90... And then I, I went... I studied geography and environmental studies in a college at university. And, you know, uh, as a result, I just wanted to travel a lot. So I was a hitchhiker for a bit. Mm. And then, you know, when you go to, through university... So the the future is like, you know, I was a budget, budget student. So I, I got bursary from the government to, to study. And uh, by the end of studying, I had to go and work for the government for two years. So it was mm. a compulsory. So compulsory was a military service for one year and two years working somewhere. They will just send you to some provincial area in Belarus. And yeah, I had to do that. So it's just, you know, for a young person... It's not really a nice future, is it? You know, going military. So I just thought, I need to try something else. And I remember hitchhiking somewhere in North Russia, Northwest Russia. Near, you know, Solovetsky Archipelago, the Solzhenitsyn wrote, the, you know, the book about the uh, uh, camps, uh, exile camps. In, I, in I, haven't, I haven't actually read the Gulag Archipelago, but I really should at some point, yeah. But anyway, that was the area where... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I seriously, I remember with my friend, we were hitchhiking and uh, I thought next year I should do something with my life because, um, you know, uh, I was going to finish study quite, you know, soon and then I just thought I need to do something because I can't rely on anyone in my life and I thought I should come to England, try to go, not England, to go abroad mm. and just get international experience. There was something quite exciting so I had all those uh, ideas and uh, about uh, beautiful West, basically. <laughs> beautiful and discovered West, uh, you know, a lot of them are quite naive. So I came as a farmer worker in May- near Maidstone, first mm. time, like for six months. And then I was visiting London and uh, I was just overwhelmed by the vibrance of London, by the multicultural side of it and just was overwhelming for for me and I thought I just need to spend a year and here and just like just check things out learn about different things and then and then the longer I stayed in London the longer I wanted to stay even you know I wanted to stay even longer so and yeah so for me it was just sort of a quite a incredible place to be uh, as a as a foreigner uh, coming from that state part of the world yeah just because it was very it was such a big contrast and um, yeah and just you know that feeling of democracy and all sorts of things but then uh, later you just learn that not not everything is uh, you know as perfect as I imagined you know but that's a different story, I suppose. Sure, sure, sure and and I don't know maybe I'm just being overly nostalgic but I feel like much happier about like the early 2000s than I do about <laughs> contemporary Britain I have to say uh, right, yeah. but also there's a certain amount of like I was I guess in my mid to late teens at that point and you know I'm a 30 something now so <laughs> there's a certain amount of like uh, as a teen I probably just wasn't aware of as much but yeah certainly stuff has taken a kind of a dark political turn here over the last little while but uh, i probably shouldn't go too far down that road um <laughs> no yes we all we all concern i suppose with our uh, political volatile climate in the moment <laughs> yes yeah um so i wanted to pick up a little bit obviously you're belarusian rather than rather than russian and you talked a little bit about cultural and like national identity being kind of mixed up in in belarus could you talk a little bit more about that um Yes, uh, sure. Um, it, it's you know, I, I guess uh, when it, when it comes down to Belarusian, let's say literature, Belarusian music, um, or Belarusian cultural heritage, you know, quite often it comes down to you know folklore, folk mm. culture, and then obviously there is a Russian Belarusian literature, Belarusian music. But when you when there is a, I remember you know studying Belarusian literature. I've never been inspired by that so much because it's all uh, very much uh, reflected on Second World War mm. and on uh, being uh, 
underdogs of Russian, either Russian Empire, you know, that sort of constant struggle mm. that has a strong political side, a political side, and also, you know, that um, uh, gruesome time um, uh, of Second World War, that, you know, every fourth Belarusian was killed during Second World War. And, you know, uh, Belarus was the, uh, suffered most of, uh, most more than any other countries, uh, you know, more than Russia, more than Ukraine, more than any countries, you know, uh, you know, villages were burned down with people, you know, or just, uh, yeah, you know, and obviously, uh, you, you find it a lot in literature. And I remember, you know, it was compulsory for us to study Belarusian literature and Belarusian works, but I just got bored with all that. I just thought, mm. yes, and then this is the, the this is our history, but then I can study this through history and how much how much we can just write about the same thing, how much yeah. we can just talk all the you know. And then Russian literature was was you know, they were taken further, you know. There were you know, interesting philosophical discussions, you know, Yurid Bulgakov and it's not just about you know, communism and challenging communism, but it also just opens things up, you know, because, uh, you know, culture is important, but there is something something that takes you beyond, you know, when you read, you know, there is the, there is always something, you, you, you always discover the idea of God in, you know, in uh, Dostoevsky's work and uh, Bulgakov's, it gives you sort of different dimension of thinking, you know, and mm. for me there was quite, quite something, and also, I remember one of the lessons they we had um, we had a short introduction to Russian futurism, mm. and I was about probably fourteen and fifteen. And I remember I, I read this poem by Vladimir Khlebnikov, "The Invocation of Laughter," and it just blown my mind because uh, that poem didn't have any restrictions, any order, any rules, nothing. It was just like a combination of what you know one word and uh, and just using the root of that word uh, or laughing uh, by adding prefix or you know or and different endings and just like playing around just with one word mm. and I thought oh my god it, that, that was amazing so I thought wow I always I always felt restricted but like I felt like I was forced to be restricted by the society where I was mm. living and I, with that poem, I didn't feel any restrictions. I thought, you can just do anything with mm. the language or why would we need restrictions? So that was for me, uh, uh, I remember that very clearly. So I, and then I became a bit naughty. I remember instead of uh, learning poems by, because it was compulsory for us to learn poems uh, at school. So I was just making things up. So uh, my teacher would feel a bit stupid that she did, wouldn't know that poem. <laughs> but in fact, if she did not to know the poem. I was just, I was just too lazy to learn somebody's poem. So I will write my own poem and read it to her, you know, without saying I wrote it. So that's sort of imply. Oh, it's just this this really obscure, cool. Yeah, poet. that's another poem by Klebnika for Daniel <laughs> Kams, you know. And she's like, you know, obviously she didn't want to say anything that she would just quietly agree because it, it will be a bit embarrassing for a teacher that, uh, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a student will tell something that she wouldn't know, you know, especially in front of other uh, students. So that was, uh, for me, yeah, so, if, yeah, I was, uh, I would say I was strongly influenced by Russian literature, more than by Belarusian literature. Mm. And then looking into, I mean, there are a lot of great... Um, but it's also a bigger country, and you know sure. Belarus was suppressed. But that's only what, that's one side. But you know when it comes down to let's say because I was growing up in the countryside, and I always been very strongly connected with nature, and you know that Belarusian. Uh, I think my Belarusian identity probably this is where it begins with the countryside and uh, with nature with that. Uh, flat landscape with thousands of lakes with forests uh that's how i spent my childhood uh, you know being almost self-sufficient you know growing your own things you know my grandparents had a little farm so yeah that's sort of my i suppose uh my belarusian identity you know remains there you know mm. but 
but you know, I always wanted to also come out, you know, of that just, uh, or, you know, just that circle and just experience something different. I remember just, you know, sitting on the roof of my, uh, my parents' shed and just staring at the horizon, imagining that what what is there, you know, what other, what other cultures, other places. So I always had a strong desire to explore the world, and you know, so. But then, every time when I come back to Belarus, I have a very strong connection with nature. I mm. know that, and uh, it, it's it just that sort of a feeling that you know that's quite a, almost you know, indigenous you know tribal where you just you know as as a as a person who grows up in mountains has a strong bond with mountains. That's how mm. I feel with the you know Belarusian landscape. Okay. That's that's really interesting, um, and in terms of your in terms of your music, you you sing in in Russian rather than rather than Belarusian. Is is that just like a kind of like a practical consideration, or is there like another reason for that? Um, unfortunately, my Belarusian language um, has become uh, very rusty, um, mm. uh, just because as again, it's just because I. Uh, I've been more influenced by um, Russian literature than mm. Belarusian literature, so I yeah I didn't have enough practice, I suppose. And, sure. You know, just uh, Belarus is the with Lukashenko regime. Um, um, we you know Belarusian language um, uh, has become secondary. Sure. And uh, when I went to university. It wasn't even cool to speak Belarusian at university. Mm. And when you're a young student, then you just try to be, you know, as a little bit, you know, just to fit into the environment sure. where you are. And, uh, yes, yeah, so a Russian language just uh, took over. So, uh, obviously, it's partly my fault, in a way, just because I didn't make a deliberate decision, I suppose, to, uh, you know, to preserve it. And... Um, but it's also, you know, it's just that time, you know, I'm just uh, that generation. I mean, now you, now there is a, there is alternative um, site in Belarus, and you know, and people do, there are, you know, a lot of cultural activities where Belarusian language is used, um, which is good. Mm. But, you know, I don't really like forcing things. Sure. Uh, overall, you know, so for instance, if I write a poem or a song, I don't want to just let's say write it in english or write it in belarusian language or any language if it's if it doesn't feel natural mm, so yeah, to yeah. me you know it's it, to me it's, it feels very natural to to write songs in or poems in russian language mm. yeah it's just a yeah that's about it probably yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's quite a lot of a, a, a practical thing. Yeah, I suppose it is practical, yeah, rather than anything else, yeah. Yeah, because that sort of ties in with the with the little I know about Belarus. I, I really don't know a, a ton. Um, and a lot of it was that I did know was kind of like via Russian stereotypes of the place. Like, the main thing I knew was... You know, from growing up here was about Lukashenko and like, oh, it's Europe's last dictatorship, etc., etc. And then going to Russia, it was just, oh, that's the place where all the, you know, good meat and dairy products come from. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's yeah, milk is uh, is one of the main industries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of like in in Russian supermarkets. If something had a Belarusian flag on it, it was it was kind of like a prestige. This will be good kind of indication. Oh, I didn't know that. That's good to know. That's good to know that Belarusian quality is well respected in Russia. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, the good thing about the, uh, you know, there are not always just bad things about Lukashenko. I guess he's in a way, what well, you know, compared to Russia, he's kind of, uh, I suppose, he he likes certain order and he's quite strict with a bit of a quality with the quality with the corruption you know mm. so he 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 holds the you know that tight and uh, and sometimes 
in a funny way, it works in certain areas. Mm. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It just, uh, I guess, uh, Belarusian society is just going through its own evolution, and uh, it just happened to be Lukashenko who is taking control of that. But it's definitely, sure. it's not as as uh, messed up as Russia, you know, because when you when you cross the border, Belarus and Russia, the Belarus is just, you know, cleaner country. Mm. Russia is just, a, overall, it's a big mess, in my view. You mm. know? And uh, I would say Belarusian people are more humble as well. Gotcha. Overall. <laughs> but then I don't want to make uh, sweeping statements and generalize people. Oh, you know? oh of like, course, of course. Uh, yeah, but it's not just my uh, statement. I, I, hear the, I hear people saying that a lot, so... But. Well... I mean, I'm 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 British, so there's there's definitely the whole being a you know quote unquote great power at one point in your history tends to go to a lot of people's heads. So I can see how that might have happened to the Russians as well. All right, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, so before we get on to talk about the film that we're going to be watching for this episode, kind of an unusual thing is that. I've not normally had guests who've actually been in a film themselves. So I, I hope you wouldn't mind me bringing up uh, the, the Nonsense Express film that you were in a few years back. Oh, yes. It's a documentary film, though. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still a film. Well, I, I, I suppose, yes. Uh, partly documentary, partly probably a little bit fiction. Or at least it feels uh, now as, as a fiction, you know. Sure. Um, Oh, wow. Yes. So tell me about the Nonsense Express. <laughs> um, well, this is the thing. I haven't been able to track it down anywhere, but uh, when I was just doing my kind of research prior to, to talking to you, it was one of the things that, that came up and it just sounded like it was this kind of interesting journey that you went on and were followed around by a camera crew. Yes, Um it's only half an hour, but yeah. Um, but I mean, it was shown in cinemas here and everything. So yes, we 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 toured. Uh, we went on tour to uh, to France and Holland with that film, Germany, uh, and yes, in London uh, we we screened it in a few places. Uh, so how it all started with my original lineup, we um, we were very naive and we just wanted to play. And uh, I used to work with Ned Crowther on double bass and Phil Brown on drums. <laughs> and they wanted, to, they thought just because it's a Russian language project, we should definitely take it to Russia to show it. Because we think, we all thought it's quite unusual that uh, there is this Russian speaking guy and then this British band. So it's quite international you know, company, but then, you know, it, it's it's not quite often you have a, a Russian-speaking person, you know, supported by British band. Yeah. So, so and then we had uh, also um, Marianne Nordic, uh, she played flute. So it was, uh, we kind of, uh, back then, we sort of, it was, was more a folky sound that we developed. Mm. Double bass and, you know, acoustic guitar drums and flute and so I just uh, <laughs> I remember uh, first time I got credit card so we just thought, we just thought yeah let's just do it one of the rehearsals and I just booked the flight tickets to Moscow I found a very cheap flight tickets to Moscow and I had a friend living there and I once I booked the flight tickets I just thought well I should organize this tour now so I started contacting venues and everything uh, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg and the, back then already I had the, my first album Hanuma released and I thought well it's sort of a good opportunity so I was sending all the details about the album just, and I got a few gigs confirmed and I thought well they and they said they will help me to promote them so I, I I thought that's that's a good selling point, you know, uh, Russian music from London, and I thought people will be just oh, genuinely curious to see if there's so any, uh, you know, um, uh, listings of this uh, event in Moscow and in Saint Petersburg. And in fact, in Saint Petersburg, I had um, my album was released on Bomba Peter, 
uh, to label and I actually the owner of that label helped me to get a gig in St. Petersburg so I thought I'm safe we are safe we, we should have we should just have fun in Russia and uh, my double bass player's a friend um, uh, he also joined us um, just to film uh, he said oh I, I can join you he's from uh, he's half French half uh, British Rob Dumas and um, he just wanted to go to Russia you know it's exotic for for Western people to go there sure I can relate to that one <laughs> yes and he just had a camera with him you know and he was just filming us uh, on our journey and what happened, it just started very badly from right at the beginning. We flew with Austrian Airlines, uh, so we had to um, change in Vienna. And <laughs> double bass, we didn't have a hard case for double bass. Oh no, I know where this is going. <laughs> and uh, so we bought a separate ticket to take it on board. Uh, okay. So we called uh, the airlines and they confirmed that, that uh, instead of a passenger, there will be a double base sitting. And they confirmed there will be enough space. Anyway, anyway, so we, we, we flew to Vienna with a double base sitting next to us. But then in, in Vienna, when we had to change the uh, flight to Moscow, we were told that we can't uh, bring a double base. Uh, on board. Oh no! It's just it's against uh, health and safety. So basically, the band members we decided that I stayed with double base in Vienna, and they just fly, and I will just fly with the next flight. So that they confirm that that you know I don't have to pay extra. With they will just sort out the double base issue, mm. because actually I had a ticket, I had all the confirmation. Anyway, so th what they said, they promised me to put this double base into the hard case, so it will be all secure, so but it will travel in the luggage area rather than um, rather than with me. So I thought, well, I you know, if you contrast German and Austrians with this, you know, you know, they're normally quite meticulous with quality, with their promises, and <laughs> so I trusted them. But then when I arrived in uh, Moscow a few hours later. And when I was collecting my luggage, uh, yeah, I went to collect the double base and it was broken down in pieces. It oh, was no. Just damaged. And it was a 19th century double base as well. And oh, it wasn't gosh. mine. Uh, you know. So this how it all started. And uh, so we had to look for a double base. Uh, so this is how we were dedicated. Because, in fact, the net, he's... Uh, incredibly talented bass player so he actually if he wanted to he we, we would just bring a bass guitar you see yeah. we didn't have to take this double bass but just because he everyone is so excited to go to russia to play for russian audience this russian music from from london you know, and we just thought double bass has a different, you know, obviously different tone. And, you know, it's just, it's all about the look, about a whole presentation. Whole oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's, so, a, it's a visual statement. So we just thought we, we should make an effort, you see. Uh, and even after the double bass got broken, we still didn't give up. We, in, in fact, I... I managed to borrow a double bass in Moscow from one of the musicians who played with Andrei Makarevich. You know Machina Vremini band? Oh, uh, yeah, know. yeah, I've heard yeah. of them. So anyway, anyway, so I don't know by how, but uh, by miracle, we uh, I meet this guy, this one of those musicians, and he, uh, he lends me his double bass. So the first gig is at, seven, uh, at Zhao Da in, Ch in Chinatown, in Moscow, in Kitai Gorod. So we all kind of, uh, well, we sort of uh, cheered ourselves up and uh, getting ready for a gig. The venue provides us the mail and they're very hospitable and the guys are excited. But then it just feels sparse in the venue. We feel like, oh, it's about half an hour before the show and we, we barely see anyone here. <laughs> so yeah. we have like... We have basically our first gig and we have like probably five people in the audience. Oh no. So whole whole our trip is just like that, it's just being uh, playing uh, in empty venues in Moscow gotcha. and St. Petersburg. In Minsk our gig gets cancelled and then another gig but then 
the organizers uh, asked me to pay for playing there even I remember wow so it was just like really bad and I just thought wow what a it was a very gruesome time because you know we were quite naive quite romantic I would say you know uh, very romantic just wanted to play have fun you know uh, me interested in people but just like we brought our music to no one nobody so what happened and Rob was filming us in that situation and uh, the final part of that, the, my my brother, he's a psychotherapist and psychologist, mm. and he also he has a friend, and she she works as the, as a therapist or art therapist in a psychiatric ward in Minsk or near Minsk. There is a place called Navinki, and the, she organized different events for for the for people there, for the patients and i've done one event and they do you know all great things paintings and small theater shows and the, he suggested if we wanted to play in a psychiatric ward for those people so i just thought yeah yeah and ask guys and, and i asked the guys and they agreed but by then we were already very tired and exhausted by all mm. those all that drama sure seriously anyway and then uh, but when we arrived to play this psychiatric award uh, it was uh, anchor people were dancing people were so happy to that music the response was incredible it, it, and it's all was was documented so that's why it's called the nonsense express because express is obviously train you know quick tour in russia and belarus and then after all going that drama the finale is is the actual concert at the psychiatric ward and how it was received by by many people. So that was quite a beautiful ending. But then you know, obviously, we had to when we came back to to England, London, we we were we were so exhausted and we we just needed a break. And I was actually seriously considering uh, <laughs> to give up because it was such sure. a bad life. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a story. <laughs> but hey, you 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 bounce back. Yes, yes, never give up, never give up. Awesome. Um all right then. So so from one film to another, I think we should probably introduce the the movie that we that we're going to watch. Um yes. And so we've talked a little bit about World War 2 and Belarus's particularly you know, no one had a good experience in World War Two, but you know, if there was any place that you could choose not to be, that probably would be it. So, the the movie we're watching is called Come and See, and it's directed by Elam Klimov. Now, you've seen this one before, haven't you, Sasha? I have. Yes, I have. I watched it once. Okay. Um, uh, is that a while ago or relatively recently? Uh, maybe about seven, eight years ago. Okay. Um, see, I haven't seen it. I've been kind of putting it off because I wanted to watch it for, for the podcast. And the thing that everyone tells me is that it really stays with you and that it's kind of upsetting. It is very upsetting, it, it, but um, it is upsetting. But, you know, it's quite it, uh, I think it's important to show to to show what to you know to show that um, reality that will happen in Belarus and it it is it is quite upsetting yeah I remember watching with my my English friends and yeah it was quite uh, quite something yeah, yeah what what did they make of it well I guess partly <laughs> uh, there was a there was a slight doubt that probably was a little bit exaggerated in mm. the events themselves. Really? Okay. The way. But um, no, to me, everything felt quite real, how it all was, you know, um, um, acted and, you know, the, 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 the story itself, the way it sure. feels, you know, feels quite, you know, quite convincing, I would say, yeah. Sure. And, you yeah. know, obviously, also I had the stories from you know my uh, grandfather. He, he he was a veteran, and 
he was injured in, you know, my grandparents. It's just, you know, when you grow up in Belarus uh, during that time, all you hear is just about, you know, the the about Second World War is still echoed, you know. In, sure. You know, um, back then I remember it was just, um, it was, yeah, you uh, you turn TV on and all you see is films about Second World War. Sure, mm-hmm. sure, sure. Because, I mean, here in, in the UK, the Second World War... Well, again, with local politics, shall we say, it it is something that's very, like, it looms large in our historical memory, and we were never, we were never invaded, and whereas Belarus, obviously, you guys were completely overrun, completely occupied, the whole country was, yeah, taken over. Yes, it was the first uh, country to be invaded by... Nazi, uh, you know, first the uh, USSR part, uh, part of sure, the USSR sure, that sure. was invented and was uh, held in Brest like for a month. I can't remember. I don't want to mm. lie, but it was, it was, yeah, it was um, 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 heroic, uh, you know, movement. And uh, you know, every fourth Belarusian died during the Second World War. It's, uh, it was a tragedy, and uh, people fought uh, in. In uh, you know partisans fought uh, against Nazi and you know also obviously soldiers and but it's also a very controversial whole thing you know it's sure. not just one side that is bad side and one the other side is just good side you know you hear all different things you know like my grandma used to say uh, a Belarusian partisan will come out of the forest and he will he will just uh, they will rob women. You know, take the you know chickens and everything. They will rape women, and they just go into the forest to fight Nazi. And at least when a German soldier will come, a German soldier will pay money. So you can also mm-hmm. hear that sort of stories. But wow. obviously, just because just because it's uh, you know, but these stories are not uh, as common as the other stories. That you know, in the war, you you just it's it's not just one side. It's it's just muddled up. It's horrible, and, mm. and you know, uh, there are different things. You 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 know, and uh, you hear. And uh, in fact, uh, talking about Belarusian writers, I think he, in my view, Vasily Bykov is the one who is really worth reading because okay. he writes a lot about all his books are about um, the war, but also. He describes very well the human psyche, and it's uh, that it's not necessarily just about you know just about the politics, just about bad Nazi, bad Germans, you know, good Russians. But he actually describes all these things. You know, the, the very they're just almost like psychological thrillers. Um, mm. So yeah, so it's a big uh, respect to Vasily Bikov, and if you can find any translations to English. You should read it. And in fact, I think some films, I think one or two films were made uh, on his, based on his um, uh, books. I can't, oh, okay. I can't remember which one, but if I find out, let me find out and I'll let you know. Yeah, well, and now I have his name. That's, that's, you know, will point me in the right direction in terms of, in terms of research. So the reason that I figured that this film was kind of quote unquote eligible for, for my podcast, because obviously I focus on, on Russian stuff so i don't want to be just lumping in you know oh belarus russia it's basically the same i don't want to be like that at all the reason i thought this should count was that it's a russian belarusian co-production in that it's belarus film and mos film and also the director lm klimov uh is a russian so so that was yes. that was my thinking like ah, uh, i can kind of crowbar this into the remit of the podcast of course yes Yes, yeah, so as we've probably made pretty clear, this is not necessarily a film for everyone. It's potentially quite upsetting. So with those warnings out of the way, we'll be on with the film. So at this point, we like to speak a little bit of Russian. And, and the word that we say is payekhali. And so the reason we picked that is because it's what Yuri Gagarin said when he was blasting off uh, to become the first person in space. So it, it seems like a good thing to used to launch into something although <laughs> obviously this time around <laughs> he didn't say palizeli he said paiechali 
It said Payecheli, yeah, I guess old habits oh. die hard, yeah. Apparently, <laughs> apparently he wasn't particularly a, a pedant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yes, it should have been Politili, which would have been we're off, as in we're flying. That's Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Russian is, is very specific when it wants yeah. to be. yes. All right, so three, two, one. Payecheli! Sasha and I have just watched Come and See. And before Sasha gives you the rundown of the plot, this is the usual obligatory spoiler warning. If you don't want to know what happens in the film, you haven't watched it yet, and don't want your experience spoiled that way, pause the podcast and watch the film. All right, with that out of the way, over to you, Sasha, for a brief summary. Yes, we watched um, the film, Come and See. Um, I actually watched it twice. First time I watched it was um, about seven years ago with my uh, friends in London. To be honest with you, I, I, um, I didn't know about this film before, so I actually found out about this film in London. Um, it is a very, very um, disturbing film, in my view. Uh, it's about... Um, there is a main character... A Flora, who happened to be um, a young adult Ill, uh, growing uh, growing up in a small village in uh, Belarus during the Second World War. What happens as many other boys uh, during that time, he, he was growing up uh, without his dad uh, because a lot of uh, men had to go and join uh, uh, the Red Army to fight to fight Germans, and um, his main aspiration was uh, to join partisans or to fight uh, to fight Germans as well. So um, the film kind of begins very comical. Um, you know, he and another boy they just sort of trying to find weapons, digging in um, in the sand, and they're making kind of jokes, imitating. German enemy and uh, so th there is all that sort of uh, mixture with also Belarusian humor, Belarusian folklore and then when he finds a gun he comes home and he tells his mom uh, that he wants to join a partisan force and obviously mother is very devastated she's got also two little daughters, twins and this is how the plot uh, evolves uh, you know, the boy goes through through different, uh, very dramatic uh, and very rapid uh, changes in his uh, in his youth. A lot of things happening within very uh, relatively short period of time. So he joins partisan force, and then because he's still, uh, you can see that he's got at the beginning. He's got a very gentle side in him, and very very naive side in a way. So uh, the partisans leave the the base camp and they uh, you know they go somewhere to fight Nazis. I'm not sure exactly where where, where they go, but then then he just he was left uh, with this young girl, and we can assume what was been happening with her in her life. But anyway, just because uh, the the actual base camp was attacked by, from the air. They had to run away, so they decided to come back uh, to his village where he comes from with hope that he can stay with his uh, lady friend in at his parents' house. But when he returns to his village, he finds out that his mother and his uh, little sisters are not alive and people literally were slaughtered in, uh, in that village. And there is obviously a moment of despair and... Uh, he finds he finds a little island in the forest. The, why it's an island is because it's surrounded by bogs. And Belarus was famous by 
of this box they're quite it's a quite typical ecosystem in Belarus and there's mm. still quite um, quite a few areas that surrounded by box and it's historical fact that Germans w- w- didn't have any experience how to cross them and a lot of them actually drowned and there is a famous actual story about this one boy who sacrificed his life and instead of leading the Germans to um, the partisan base camp, he led them into a borg where all, where all of them drowned, but obviously the boy was killed. So mm-hmm. it has that sort of uh, also that side uh, showing that Belarusian um, unique landscape and the, obviously people, local people knew about it and they used that uh, opportunity to hide from from Germans. However, the island is uh, secluded, surrounded by bogs, no enough food. So there are some people who return to villages, local villages, to seek food and bring them back to to this uh, to this island. So boys goes as well on a mission with another two two men. However, during uh, this operation, these two men get killed, and there is this very dramatic scene when. Uh, they go to this village and they force a man uh, uh, who I assume was supporting the Germans. Uh, that's why he had a f- he was living comfortably. He had food and cow and all other means to, to, to live a comfortable life during the war. So they take his cow together with him and... Uh, and the there is also this Belarusian humor going on all the time. So the the guy, one of the uh, one of the other characters that Flora was uh, on the mission with, uh, he's he's very. You can see that he's very optimistic, and he always brings humor into all those difficult, precarious situations. So the plot evolves that the take this cow and they run through the open field in the fog uh, and at night so hopefully they can bring the cow to the island and then feed people with milk or I don't know they could slaughter them um, and uh, supply meat to to those people on the island but unfortunately German, German soldiers find out about these two guys stealing the cow and they send uh, they send these uh, lights into the I don't know how they yeah, do like, it. The like show, flares. yeah, exactly, yeah, that's it. And they can see these two silhouettes in the, in the field, so they start uh, shooting with machine guns. And uh, Flora's companion gets killed, and then the cow gets killed. So he and this is uh, and then he basically being exhausted, fall asleep um, uh, next to a cow, and in the morning. It's a beautiful scene as well, this dead cow and, you know, oof, this fog, the, the heavy mist that heavily can see anything. And then he starts walking, uh, trying, desperately trying to drag this cow, but he can't, obviously, he doesn't have enough strength. And then he, he sees a, a horse, a horse with a um, courage in um, in the fog. So he tries to take this horse, and then he sees this little uh, an old peasant uh, loading a uh, loading hay on the on his uh, on his uh, carriage. And then he starts talking, and he wants to take this horse. But then the, he can hear that there are Germans uh, driving their uh, cars or trucks or motorcycles. So. So th- basically, there is no any other choice, but this old man offers him to pretend that he's his uh, grandson, uh, or, uh, well, the, initially there was a different story, that he's one of the uh, his neighbors in the village. And he tells me what, who are his parents, blah, you know, etc. But then he thinks that, oh, you just be my grandson. So they arrive in this village, and there's the horrible, terrific scene of... Germans uh, surrounded this village and then basically they go through each house and then just uh, uh, force, push um, all the people, especially uh, women with young children into one big um, big shed. But then they, they lie to them, they say, oh, if you wish to immigrate to Germany, a civilized country, this is what you need to do, prepare all the documents, so they don't mm-hmm. really tell them that what's going to happen to them. So and there is this um, terrible scene when um, these people get burned in the, 
in a shed, and Flora happened to be in that shed, but then he manages to escape from the window, and then obviously he um, he's totally terrified and in a way emotionless and lost uh, in his thoughts, and he just uh, witnessed uh, all those. Uh, those just uh, horrific scenes, yeah, a- appalling, appalling scenes, yes. Um, and the yeah, the film comes to the end when um, those German troops get actually defeated and um, by partisans, and then he meets again those partisan that he joined initially, and also you know he recognized the some of those Germans that got um, arrested. And then, yes, so that shows uh, uh, some historical facts, you know, how many villages were burned in Belarus, mm-hmm. how many people were killed. And then um, there is this scene when he, jo- before walking away from uh, that scene where those uh, the rest of Germans uh, were executed, talking about the official Germans, the ones who actually uh, give the orders to burn people alive and etc., uh, he sees this uh, image, propaganda image of Adolf Hitler, and he starts shooting her. That's actually the first time when he actually, I think, uses his rifle, the one yes. that he found. That was the first time, and he sh- keeps shooting his, in his... And then the, those scenes uh, going backwards and backwards and backwards to the time where Adolf Hitler is a, is a baby sitting on the laps of his mother... And this is where he hesitates where he whether he should continue shooting or not. So he doesn't shoot uh, the baby Adolf, uh, and then he just joins the the troops, uh, the partisan troops. And um, yeah, that's how the film comes to the end. But overall, these scenes are quite dramatic, and uh, in my view, they were very well shot, uh, considering the budget and considering mm. the time as well. And it's still, you know, it was. Um, shot in 1980s and released in 1985 so for me it's quite impressive for that time the actual achievement of this film that's how I feel it's yeah it's it's quite it's it is quite powerful and it's uh, quite disturbing to watch certain scenes of course yeah ab- absolutely um thank you sasha for that wonderful summary it's uh, it's a hard it's a hard film to summarize because it's not that heavy on on plot as you as you say that it's kind of following this young kid around and just you know the different the different sections so it's it's not so much like this happens because of this it's it yeah it's 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 not just a classic uh, war film. It has also no, that sort of no, psychological. No. It's a kind of psychological thriller as well as the you know just it, it, it's not an action film. No, uh, it just you know a sort of exploration of that sort of, uh, human psyche, or that you know that um, happened to be um, surrounded by this this evil force. Mm. And uh, you know that strength that gives not to surrender to that evil force, but somehow just to fight to to fight. But then obviously there are all sort of things, feelings of guilt because uh, Flora thinks that his mother and his sisters got killed in the whole village mm. because uh, Germans found out that he joined the um, partisan force. Yeah, and his his mother specifically warned him. And it's it's quite disturbing that little scene as well. She, the mother, picks up this like wood cutting axe and basically says, "You know what? You might as well just kill all of us right now." And then yeah. she starts like hitting him because this is, you know, she understands as an adult better than he does as a yeah. as a young young teenager the the reality of mm. if you're associated with with the partisans then the germans may well just shoot you and we and we never know for certain whether that's why the mother and we never see the mother and the the two young sisters bodies the bodies that we see in that village scene it's very fleeting it's kind of like it's a pile of of yeah. bodies against against the against the wall and then it's yeah. and then it's very quick yes um, actually, that that's one thing I was I was going to say. It is a horrific film, but it's quite 
like I don't know if this is the right word, but tasteful in terms of the in terms of the violence. Like you don't mm. often see like horrific things firsthand. Things either happen off screen or you see the after effect. And and don't get me wrong, some of it is pretty graphic. Like I think most notably to me is when you see the uh, I guess he's like a village elder who you see right at the beginning. He turns up later and he's been he's been set on fire and he's yes and he's just about to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's he's just a mass of like kind of black and mm. like flesh and, and yeah. blood and it's 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 quite quite upsetting. And then also you see a young I guess she's like a, a teenager who's who's been raped by the uh, the like SS guys and yes. you just see the 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 blood down down her mm. her legs and it's that's very upsetting um yeah there's there's a lot that's disturbing in this film but it's not it's not as graphic say as something like schindler's list where you're seeing people being shot in the head all the time this it, it the violence isn't like that but it is it is still yeah, it's still horrific. Yeah, it's uh, the violence is shown for the sake of violence. It's it, it, it's it's. I think it's well, uh, it's well, well, well edited probably in the yeah. film that it just sort of you know it doesn't show the just 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 violence after violence, violence after violence shows those sort of you know it it does come across realistic and uh, yeah perhaps this is how how it looked you know this is how it looked. Mm. Uh, you know, as a, as an act, you know, back then mm. during the Second World War. Yeah, it's it's sensitively handled, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So it it is. Um, I mean, I've had uh, some really harsh critiques about this film from hmm. the Russian side, actually. Also, oh, okay. like saying, huh. "Oh, it's impossible. This is, could have happened. It's all like over dramatized and." But I don't think this film is over dramatized. I don't think it comes it comes across like that in my view. Mm. But we sort of agree, I, I, I think, on that. Um, um, yes. What, what what other thoughts you have, Alistair? Um, I was interested in particularly hearing your your views on how they handled like the sound and the music. Right. Yeah. Um, well, the music. <laughs> It's it it is actually a very typical approach in um, in Soviet films to use mm. classical music. Yeah, you know, to use Requiem, to use Mozart, you know, mm. to use Bach. So um, I think it it works very well. Um, mm. I don't know what music, uh, what other music could be used. Uh, it's also you know thinking about the music back then in nineteen eighties. Mm. What sort of music uh, was there? Um, yeah, I mean it's it's quite sparingly used. So yes, you you have bits of classical music, and occasionally you get a little bit of of synth in there, but it's usually like one or two notes, and it's yeah. quite subtle. Yeah, it is quite subtle. Yeah, it, it's it's not you know like when you say eighties and you say synth, you kind of think of something like. Blade Runner or Chariots of Fire, where it's kind of like, do, 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 do. yeah, yeah, it's it's not like that. That would that would be very uh, very unusual, <laughs> incongruous. Yeah, and yeah. that's something that definitely dates a movie. I mean, I would if someone had just like stuck this on for me and I knew nothing about it and no context, I think I would find it hard to say when it was made. I might guess seventies or or eighties, just based on some of the special effects but there's there's nothing like particularly obvious that mm. dates it in terms of in terms of what they've they've used it so that's that works very well for it yes um again in terms of the sound there was a couple of things i i really liked they had this buzzing of the fly when flora and uh, glasha i think is the is the girl's name yes. when they're in the house just before they discover the bodies and i had a fairly good idea just from having seen the trailer that that's what they were going to see and when you and you know what you tend to associate flies with you know death and decay but it is very very tense because you know something 
really unpleasant is is coming and it just heightens the the tension and yeah i think they kind of use the use flies on and off throughout actually and 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 later on they they incorporate some um some i guess like newsreel footage from the time where you actually see some uh some corpses yeah. i guess from a concentration camp or something because they're very very thin and emaciated and that that is a you know obviously a an extremely disturbing image and you know it's it's i assume real footage that they that they cut in there yes it is real footage yeah 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 i thought so i, I mean i've seen it's a very long time ago but i've seen judgment at Nuremberg, which I think used some real footage mm-hmm. in there as well, and it's yeah at the end of the film, especially they mm. yeah they're using those the real footage just sort of to summarize um the 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 impact mm. of the second world war on yeah oh, and the other music uh I wanted to mention in passing, I recognized one of the like Soviet war songs they played i didn't i didn't know the name of it so i had to look it up but uh maya maruska maya maruska da, 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 da. oh no no it, that wasn't uh that wasn't the one the one was <laughs> uh i think it's svishenaya vaina oh yes svishenaya yes davai yeah. strana agronaya stavai na smertny bo yes yeah 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 so it's uh, the the english translation is is holy war which is yeah. you know uh kind of a, a funny odd concept from a, a an atheist state but uh, you know they're using it metaphorically i'm sure uh, i looked up the lyrics of that and it's quite bloodthirsty as you might imagine uh, it is it is uh yeah that you know i was growing up with that song mm. <laughs> it's been broadly used in many screenplays and um, in different tv shows and different films as well that sure, song. sure sure um, sure and yes, that hor- horrible scene uh, in the village where the people were burned, you know, they play this also folky song with the Russian accordion, Maya Marosinka, uh, you know. Okay, yeah. Hmm. If you, I, I don't know if you remember that. I missed, yeah, I I don't think I made the connection there. Yeah, there, there, there were a few Russian, um, famous Russian or Soviet also singers, they kind of chanson hmm. singers, this is where they... This is how Russian chanson uh, evolved. Um, mm. One of the one of them is Vertinsky and then Ospensky. So this, this so I actually have an old gramophone uh, here. You know when oh, you have wow. to wind up, and then I have a few records there, old records, and actually one of them from Second World War. And actually that uh, that this is the song on side A and on side B is about. Uh, it's a partisan song, <laughs> so it's, it's uh, yeah from Second World War. And when they played that song on the, you know, on the film, yeah, it made me think about my my old record player. So, but the the way they put it as well, it's kind of very very sinister. You know, it, it's a very cheerful song about kind of jokey love. You know, and then all this horrible things just about to happen. All those Nazis um, uh, pushing. Um, Forcing all these people into that big shed, uh, big warehouse. Yeah, and I think the one of the things that's so disturbing about that is what a good time they're having. You know, it's not conducted in a in a business like efficient. Well, you know, we've decided we're going to kill everyone, so we're just going to do that. It's it's the fact that they're you know laughing and joking, and just from the way that some of the soldiers are staggering about, it seems like. They've had quite a few drinks, probably in some cases, mm. and and just yeah. And when they when they start laughing, it's just like you used the word evil before, and it's just like it's a real reminder just how horrific and horrendous things got, and and that people you know were prepared to do. It's it it, it as as I say, we've used the word disturbing a lot, but it is it's it's really it's really horrible to think that. People are capable of this. Yeah, it's quite hard to imagine. This is also that scene is actually only that scene where I actually question the um, question a little bit of acting and a little. Mm. Oh, okay. 
Well, I just, well, I thought to myself, I mean, I, I, as you said, it's hard to imagine that a human being is capable of doing this, mm. especially the way they all laughing. And, but also, you know, I thought, I, I don't know if I missed it or there was a, did you notice that some German soldiers in that scene also kind of felt a little bit unsure? I don't think they, they actually were having fun, but they obviously, mm. they had to, uh, they couldn't express or oppose any orders because they would have been killed themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I kind of thought it would be nice to sort of, uh, would be interesting to show that a little bit deeper, that aspect, mm. because obviously not all German soldiers lack humanity, you know. Sure, people, sure, sure. People, you know, people went to the war for different reasons, not necessarily believing to Hitler, but also right, the right. force that they didn't know actually what was going on. You know, all sorts of aspects of human, humanity. So I just thought it would be in that scene because it's so powerful. It's also, mm. I'm sure, you know, there were, there were soldiers who were so terrified doing this that their colleagues doing this, their, you know, mm. their comrades, their, you know, the, the, the site is doing this to just human beings who are actually not mm. fighting them or anything. You see, I know that there were SS troops that actually were the most, you know, cruel troops in German mm. army. So they were trained to be cruel. So um, and and they tended to be the ones who were the most like fanatically Nazi and you know dedicated to you know quote the cause unquote. Yeah, they just l- l- simply thought that uh, anyone else is inferior to them, especially you know people not belonging to Germanic. Uh, race or oh, you know eastern europeans uh, jewish arabs they all were you know any you know they were considered as inferior to to their superior races they yeah they yeah and and they specifically address that aspect of you know nazi and fascist ideology in that once you have we mentioned you mentioned in the summary the captured soldiers including the the commander you have this like quite young like i guess he's a junior officer a lieutenant or something like that and he you know the the senior commander is 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 saying oh um i'm an old sick man like i i bear you no ill will and this is all coming through you know he's saying this in german and it's being translated by one of the i guess the russian speaking collaborators And that's contrasted with this young lieutenant who basically tells the senior commander to shut up and that he's a dog and stuff like that. And he then just explains like calmly and it's just chilling. He just explains, look, we have to kill you because some races just don't deserve a future. And, Mm. you know, our mission will succeed whether it's today or tomorrow. And it's just like, I mean, both things made me so angry watching it just the older man made me very angry just from the fact that he was kind of like uh this 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 isn't my fault you should you should spare me i didn't mean for any of this to happen it's kind of like you were you were the guy in charge yes this is this is on you and then the young guy with just like the like vicious hatred and just oh, it's 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 but so disgusting he, yeah but at least he was honest you know mm. he didn't try to i mean obviously the, the whole scene is just looks very very disgusting mm. you know mm. you, you just sort of it's it's hard to find any compassion towards them you know yeah looking yeah, yeah. what just happened and witnessing what just happened there's nothing mm. else to do but just to execute them on right a, right um Although, I mean, different readings of this, it looks like those guys are going to be set on fire themselves, but then some of the partisans just shoot them before that can happen. Yeah, and I think think it was probably, I don't know if it's the right way to say, a more noble way to to, to do that sort of execution rather than just doing pure revenge on the same sort of... Mm. uh, medieval cruel fashion you know burning people you know uh... yeah 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 i think i think that's meant to convey that hey these guys deserve to die but we're not going to stoop to their level we're you know we're gonna at least, yes yeah, yeah exactly. we're at least gonna make it a quick death um mm. so yeah ugh. um 
speaking of of compassion and and mercy you mentioned in the summary that scene almost right at the very end with flora and the uh the picture of of hitler that's that's on the ground and uh you know speaking of the kind of like dark humor that the film has the 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 caption of that picture it's um i'm pretty sure that was bella russian the the translation would be hitler liberator yes it's, i know it was russian oh okay because i thought it was because russian would be Aswobodil. yeah i just thought uh, maybe i just read it wrong because it just looked like there was an extra syllable in there and or or, or something but uh well, I think it was a uh, uh, German propaganda, so sure. I don't think so... they they invested uh, <laughs> that much time uh, invested in the, in... into Belarusian language. They knew that everybody right. speaks Russian, speaks so Russian. That all yeah. all German propaganda was translated into Russian. Mm. So, mm. yeah. Oh, and I and I definitely noticed when they were going through the village with the loudspeaker. Uh, the fact that the the, the ac- it was heavily accented Russian, but it was a bit slower, so I could actually understand that a bit better. Well, this is quite interesting, actually. It's, it's good that you mentioned that. Um, uh, what is very good in this film, they it's it's not actually heavily accent uh, to mm. the Russian. It's 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 a hybrid. Mm. It's a hybrid of Belarusian and Russian language. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, in terms of the uh, la- the language that the that the characters. Speak, but I meant specifically with the with the loudspeaker. Oh, I see. Oh, with yeah, the, yeah, with, yeah, the Ger- yes. with the Germans, it, yeah. it's it's very. They're pronouncing every syllable, and you know, native speakers tend to be less precise and faster, so they you know, emphasize everything, uh, which is what the loudspeaker guy is doing. But yeah, um, my Russian isn't fantastic, but there were definitely bits where I'm kind of like, okay. I'm pretty sure that's not just Russian on its own, particularly the the very first scene with the with the with the kids. But I guess we can come back to that. I just wanted to finish off the point with the uh, I guess compassion, maybe that final like intercut between the propaganda photo on the ground that Fleur is shooting, and then that backwards montage of Hitler and various rallies until it winds up, as you said with just seeing the the image of him as a baby in his in his mother mother's arms and that i don't know exactly what the director is getting at but it is a very powerful image you know i guess it's just the reminder that even this absolutely horrific person who was you know the inspiration for the atrocities that we've seen in the film and obviously you know yes at the same time this is a human who was a baby just like everyone else was and yeah i guess it's just maybe a reminder not to kind of like even somebody as evil as that not to bracket them off and say you know oh well they don't count as as human and therefore you know they're completely different from what i the the viewer is mm. i i don't know it's 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 a powerful image. It is a powerful image, but uh, I think also also that going through that uh, enormous grief of all mm. those uh, terrifying events, one always wants to go back to the past and maybe thinking, oh, what would have happened if you know things just evolved differently? Mm. Maybe maybe by shooting uh, that image, he just was going through this tremendous emotional experience with just shooting that image because knowing that that person was the cause of all those misfortunes and then probably just kind of hoping that, you know, with every shot he can just reverse, you know, all events backwards and then he, to, back to, you know, to, to the to the world uh, with no war, you know, mm. where he's innocent childhood in the village. And I, I don't know, maybe that sort of... But obviously, it shows that he's he, this boy is already aware of all those events. I don't know. It, mm. it, it's kind of it goes in a way surreal, which is not necessarily oh, yeah, absolutely. His, which is which is good because uh, this film also has uh, you know a video art feel. You mm. know when you mm-hmm. when you, you when you use uh, it's it's very much art film in a way. You know, it's not just a thriller. It's not just a war film or action film. It's not just like a patriotic film, but also has. All those interesting scenes that you know that actually dealing with the uh, 
with our um, you know mental with imagination with a with our you know with our emotions and um, yeah so it's quite, it's quite so it, it has this particularly that scene but also quite beautiful scene when they were in the forest flora with uh, oh with yes kill. that's yeah. that scene when the way in the rain and you know that scene when she was sitting by herself and crying and you can only guess what happened because she probably had a, some kind of affair with the commander partisan mm. commander mm-hmm. but you it's only an assumption but there was something between them and yeah. and, and and then that's uh, you know that's uh you know also that beautiful scene in the forest before german air raid you know mm. um where she, where she's dancing on the uh on the box Yes, that as well. But also, you know, when mm. it was uh, when it rained, when they were oh like, yes, uh, yeah, uh, all soaked, and you can see, you know you can see her feminine side. You know, you can see just you know that also innocence, that uh, mm. just 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 uh, desire to live, to to receive joy, and you can see that joy kind of penetrates and ex- you know uh, expels all those. War trouble suddenly, you know, the they existing in a very different realm. You know, it's mm. a different dimension almost. You know, of existence. Even you know, uh, there is the war now. You know, and uh, that's quite yeah. interesting. It takes you away for for a moment. Um, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was very well made up scene as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's in general, it's a very imaginatively put together film with those like not necessarily non-realistic but like maybe non-literal elements Mm. thrown in yeah definitely yeah uh we talked a little bit about belarusian language and you mentioned earlier uh, the the humor uh so that was something that probably went over my head a little bit uh yes uh the humor you mean um uh, in the first scene, yeah, especially. exactly, yeah. Um, it's it's it, Belarus was you know well it still remains a very much uh, rural country and even you know when people live still in towns they're very much attached to the rural side and there is sure. that sort of connection uh, there is that sort of uh, rural type of humor that they they mm. use it very well for me it was quite interesting to watch it just because this film um, referred to second world war and but then obviously i'm a very different generation now i'm sure I'm, uh, from 80s and uh, i could still relate to that humor you know the mm. how they just like how they just uh, there is this element of darkness you know in a in, <laughs> in this humor and uh, you know, just like kind of challenging each other with uh, this sort of uh, with fears, what can happen mm. if you don't do this, and uh, just basically, basically looking at the situation, uh, even in such difficult situation, but kind of optimistic as well, and that mm, sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly the scene where they're on the mission from the island in the middle of the bogs, trying to get food. That is, yeah. When they've just run away from the Germans shooting at them, um, I mean, in general, that's quite a weirdly humorous scene because throughout this whole thing, they've got this like Hitler scarecrow that they've made. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's one of the images that will definitely stay with me. Is I mean, I think I'd seen seen it beforehand, like, but not necessarily in context. The fact it's. Initially, it's this skull that they build mm. this like mud mask onto it, and then have, you know, a uh, an arm doing the Hitler salute, and then they're off on this mission, and they're taking this stupid, big, unwieldy, awkward Hitler scarecrow with them, and it just makes it, you know, obviously it's a very serious situation, but it's it's just weirdly humorous at the same time because it's just like, why would you? do this you're making something that's already going to be difficult even more difficult for yourselves yeah there is i feel like the the director wanted also to apply this eastern slavic witchcraft almost Uh, okay Hmm. you know that when you when you you, it's almost like uh, applying black magic when you want to curse somebody when you want to 
kind of if you don't have uh, abilities to fight you know with weapons you find another ability so at least you want to believe that you can use extraordinary ways to fight the evil mm, yeah. and by by doing this scarecrow because you can also see when when they, it was built people were queuing up to spot on it yeah to throw yeah, yeah. mud at it you know to show their you know hatred towards this this figure Oh, all this yeah. together, and then and then and not only after that it was carried as a symbol yeah. further. So and then where they decided to uh, stick it in on a crossroads, on a junction mm. of the roads. It, it, I think they mentioned that like they'd done several of these at one point. I, I can't remember, but perhaps, perhaps, maybe that sort of the way to to fight also the evil for them was to use uh, those. Uh, Eastern Slavic esoteric uh, beliefs because uh, rural in rural areas, especially when in Belarus, when I was growing up, people you know people do have their superstitions and they do mm. believe that oh you need to look, watch that neighbor because that neighbor pursues witchcraft. So you know mm. they do believe in all this cursing and you know so maybe and it was it's quite ingrained in the human psyche mm. in that. Uh, area and uh, i think that was probably what they wanted to use uh, also as an element and it was quite interesting to show that because that that this is what it's very likely people used to do as well you know to fight mm. the evil mm. because you know if you don't have machine guns and and you know it kind of it also stimulates people's brain gives them hope gives them strength psychological strength particularly to Carry on. Oh, oh I, I liked when they put the ears on it, and they're they're because they're deciding, you know, as they're building this head, mm -hmm. they go, "Oh, should we put ears on?" And and then someone else shouts, "Like, yes, yes, we want him to be able to hear all the yeah things we're saying about him." Exactly. So uh -huh. it does it does uh, show again that folk witchcraft uh, mm. beliefs the you know yeah. that people uh, have. In this film, you know, because they mm. wanted this, this uh, almost they want to give life to this person. They want to kind of channel through that, through that uh, scarecrow, healer scarecrow, with actual probably real adult healer, so he can hear that people actually hate him and yeah, they will it's fight. Sort of, and, yeah, <laughs> almost like a giant voodoo doll type thing. Yes, exactly. So yes, uh, Belarusian voodoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very specific type, yeah. Um, and and that, I guess, gives it a sort of a... The use of that skull gives it a slight, like, horror tinge. And the other thing, the other image that I found, like, very, very creepy, but it was hard to put my finger on why it was gave me that feeling, was uh, in that scene in, in the forest, I, I think it's just before they... Yeah, I can't remember exactly when it is, but you see repeated shots of this strange bird. It's like a crane or a stork with a very long Oh, yes. Beak. It, 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 it is a stork. Yeah. In the forest, yes. It is a stork. It's like a magic, uh, magic, magical bird uh, coming, mm. and it's almost like a messenger. But what message we don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. And it's it just gave me a very, mm. like, ugh, uneasy uneasy feeling and you have this extreme close-up of it you know it, yeah. of its beak as it's i think it's staring at them when they when they sleep and as as you say it's like a harbinger of mm. of something so that was again it was a, a, a striking image i mean yeah uh, it is quite a striking image and um, in fact a stork is a is a sacred bird in belarus so i didn't know that um mm. yes people actually build um nests for stalks in in, mm. in the, um, yards, so they, it's they always uh, there is a belief that they bring good luck. So they always mm. like to have a nest uh, for stalks, and they're very nobody hunts them like in M Middle East because it's a it's nomad bird. So it spends winter time in Morocco or in Jordan, you know, no uh, northern African countries or in mm. Middle East, mm -hmm. and then it returns to. Eastern European countries like Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Lithuania, uh, for nesting. Hmm. So, and people, particularly in Belarus, they do care about this bird. 
Mm, okay. But then, so, but then it had a strange, different image. It's almost like you know, that, but in that film, and I, I find it. So you see, he does the the director does use all those folk elements mm. in, in his film, and including you know, including the stoke birds, yeah. Mm. And it was quite also a powerful image of that dead uh, cow, the, mm. the rolling eyes. Do you remember that? That was a yes, really I do remember powerful that. image. It's also disturbing, but also powerful. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've given people a pretty good idea of what's in this film. Or, you know what it's about. Some of the some of the themes, and I really appreciate you bringing some of the cultural elements that I certainly wouldn't have known about to the surface. So I, I really appreciate that. It's really enriched my. Uh, experience of the film like after the fact because it's it's a film that will definitely stay with me and I will continue to think about I probably won't watch it again anytime soon because it's a no it's a tough watch but yeah it's definitely one that I would recommend people see but I would be very <laughs> at the same time you know what what is sad about all that period and the Belarus mm. as a country that uh, Belarus suffered most during the Second World War. Every fourth person got killed. Mm, yeah, but somehow in is somehow the history, this history of Second World War doesn't cover that well. The how much Belarusians particularly suffered. You know, we yeah. you can hear broadly about genocide. You can hear about you know Stalingrad battleship. Mm. You can see. You can you can hear a lot probably about. Yes, Leningrad blockhead, uh, all all those things. But in fact, that that Belarus is the only country that uh, over six hundred villages were burned down completely, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. every fourth person died. And I I I need to look into historical you know definitions of what genocide is. But I think mm. I think apparently there is if if you have a um, more than twenty five percent of people deliberately killed. It could be considered also as genocide. So, uh, I think Belarus deserves to be had. Uh, you know how much, how mm. much um, terrifying uh, history it has, and how much they went through. The, you know during that time during German occupation, and it's to me, to me, it's also, it, it just, it just terrific. That whole country was just literally flattened by by mm. by the, this this. Uh, terrifying events and you know yeah. it just suffered so much so much and then you know it's just because of the russian um russian occupation um imperialistic occupation sure. since you know so napoleon trying to invade the russia again he had to flatten belarus before he mm. reached russia then you have festival war the same a lot of activities were happening on belarusian side and yeah. second world war and you know, just sadly, through whole history, Belarus just always had to be um, <laughs> had to suffer most than sure. any other countries. And then you know, even Chernobyl disaster, nineteen eighty six, it happened on Ukrainian side, but just because mm. the wind was going northwest, or in fact northeast, towards mm. Moscow. But then you know, there was the order from Moscow back then to. To force the drop, the fall on the Belarusian side. Mm. All all those events, all those events. It's just like it's almost like a strange, um, you know. Some people call it just like the the cursed land. They call it, you know, just because mm. all this all these events just happen in this country, and then nobody nobody knows about this country, or very few people know about, you know, this uh, very sad history. And yeah. Until now, until now, you know, we have a dictatorship still. Right. Uh, so right. for me, so so for me, this film is is just gives the, just gives that insight into this uh, to this country that difficult history it has. Yeah, and 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 as you say, little little understood in in the West. I mean, I think people in this country are probably have a better understanding you know better to a degree anyway of of what Poland went through because people mm. are used to thinking of Poland as a separate independent country and and obviously for for British people it was Hitler going into Poland that started the war so we tend to think oh Poland and you know mm. and obviously they had 
a horrific experience as well. But I think just the post Second World War politics situation, Belarus was within the Soviet Union, so people didn't tend to even particularly think about it as you know a separate place. It was just no. part of this one big place who we really didn't like. So. Mm. Yeah, the, there are there there is this famous place near Minsk. It's about forty miles away, and it's called Hatyn. It's a memorial. It's a, it's a village. It used to be a village, Hatyn, and it was burned down by by Germans. So, oh, okay. So over over a thousand people just um, got killed in one. You know, just. Uh, in one shed, so all the all the houses were burned down, and um, so they built this memorial, and it's quite a gruesome experience. It's now it's still you know when you visit that place, all you see is just like instead of uh, on a spot of uh, each house that used to be there, there is a bell like a pillar with a bell, and mm. every time, uh, every minute this bell rings just only once. And they're just like, uh, you know, the, I don't know how many bells there, but just there are as many as the houses were in that village. Mm. And with all those names of those um, villages that, who used to live there. And it's just, it's one of the <laughs> hundreds of the villages that uh, had to go through this. You know, mm. it's, it's, mm. it's very, very striking and it shows shows this dark history. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, it's it's just terrifying, and um, the sadness is that we humans not learning anything from that war. It's people still, you know, conduct wars uh, nowadays, and you know, it's just uh, it's yeah, it's very very sad to to you know that we we're not learning from our history. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, in the film, with some of the things that are going on in contemporary politics, shall we say? This film is perhaps in some ways even more relevant than when it was when it was made because you know I I mean I don't know a ton about mid 80s politics but I guess people being on the far right was you know it was a very tiny niche thing whereas those beliefs seem to be growing now becoming yes. more mainstream and as somebody who's interested in history and has studied it i just it just horrifies me that people don't i mean i want to hope that people just don't know where this sort of thing has led in the past because if they do know and want to go that way anyway then that's just absolutely appalling but as it is it's it's pretty sickening so yeah. It is, yeah. It's quite, it's quite disturbing that far right ideologies are just growing in all parts of Europe now. Mm, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's something there. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's quite disturbing. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. What that's... a heavy, what a heavy topic to talk about. But, uh, yes. But it has to be. It has to be. Um, you know, we need to raise awareness. Uh, Ab absolutely it's it's uh i i don't say this lightly it, it's an it's an important film but i think we should probably uh go away and reward ourselves by watching uh lm klimov's earlier film uh welcome or no trespassing because it's it's also brilliant but it's it's a lot more fun yeah very uh, different topic <laughs> yeah yeah um so yes thank you sasha so much for joining me on this you know very dark journey through this film i really appreciate your insight it's it's been it's been really great and yeah very, very delighted to be on your show yeah thank you alistair for inviting me yeah great great so um before we go then uh where can listeners find your music and uh you know your general online presence where where do they need to go it's uh it's available on online, pretty much on all platforms. Online platforms: Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud. If if people don't have uh, iTunes or Spotify accounts, sure, it's... sure, sure. Uh, Bandcamp as well. I want Bandcamp to say Bandcamp as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, my website is uh, www.sashayukovic.com and. Uh, there you can find all the links to all the, all other online platforms. But cool, and, and you're on Facebook and Twitter as well. Facebook and Twitter, yes. 
um and uh what other platforms there uh instagram <laughs> of course yeah youtube um we have our own youtube channel and uh at the moment uh i am working on um finishing my belarusian trilogy so there are two mm. parts already out uh one of them is called Hierarchy, and the second uh, was released a couple of months ago uh, called I'm Afraid of Americans. Yeah, it's, uh, it's David a, Bowie cover. Yeah, yeah, it's a parody on David Bowie's uh, single and actually video, but made in the mm. uh, film uh, in Minsk. That uh, And the, the, the th- part three should be out next month of uh, my Belarusian trilogy. And at the same time, I'm working on a new project called Lessons of Russian Literature that uh, oh, awesome. is going to be a, a new album, hopefully out uh, later next year. And uh, yeah, so a few projects coming out. So yes, if you're interested, follow me on Facebook or Twitter and I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I would I would urge people to check those out. Okay, well... Thanks again, Sasha, for coming on. And thank you all for listening. Do svidaniya, folks. Thank you, Alistair. All the best. Do svidaniya. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Again, a huge thank you to Sasha Ilukovic for joining me to discuss this harrowing but important film. And another huge thank you to him and his band, The Highly Skilled Migrants, for the use of their song Cold in the intro to this podcast. You can find this song and the rest of Sasha Ilukovic and The Highly Skilled Migrants' music at bandcamp.com and also on Spotify. If you can spare a few minutes to rate and or review Roos Files Unite on podchaser.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show, that will help more people find out about us and would also really make my day. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can find the links to those in the show notes. And you can also email us at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, take care and bye for now.